Hey everybody, this is Sheets, and I'm going to be going over the UFC, what's this, 302, uh, from a DFS perspective. And again, this is the first of two videos with respect to DFS analysis. Here we're going to go over kind of fight by fight and talk about who the best plays are. Um, and in our second video related to DFS, which we'll probably do Saturday morning or Friday night, we're going to do... Uh, a lineup construction video where all we're doing is trying to create a portfolio of lineups to beat the 150 max uh, lottery tournament uh, and try to catch that $200,000. As you'll see, it's a completely different uh, skill set, uh, how to identify the best plays and then how to actually put those plays together in lineups that not only have a chance to win, but have a chance to win uh, by themselves. So uh, we'll talk about contest sims and leaving money on the table and all kinds of, of funny business, so to speak. But today we're just going to go over kind of fight by fight and identify what plays I think are going to be really solid. And we will talk about a little bit of leverage as we get kind of go through it. Uh, first thing to note is that it is uh, only a 12 fight card. And there are two of those fights that are five rounds. So this does rate to be a pretty chalky card in general, because you have two fights that are five rounds it's hard enough to fade one fight that's five rounds, but to fade two of them is difficult. And when you only have 12 fights to choose from, it makes getting different just a little harder. Uh, in addition to that, uh, when you are dealing with 12 round with 12 fights, it's not as important. Well, I shouldn't say this. It's always important to prioritize upside, but if you could even get six wins, it, it's and you're going a long way to being successful in 12 fight cards, which also means that again, to get unique is going to be extremely difficult. So I encourage you guys to um, tune in to the lineup construction video where we attempt to get unique, which is striking that, you know, that, that, that difficult balance between playing lineups that have a chance to win and playing lineups that not everybody's going to be playing. And it's, it's uh, that, you know, push and pull is really what makes, DFS fun. So we'll, we'll get into that. Uh, let's just get started with, uh, with, with Lima versus Raposo. And you, this, you already have kind of the, the overwhelming value on the slate. And that would be Lima and Andre Lima. And simply because you have a late uh, replacement here and Lima is 8,600 and he is minus 260 in the win odds. So it's uh, you're getting a lot of really, really good value here. Although, let's take a look at some of these others that are priced above. Let's look at Aline Perez, like for example. Like Perez is, yeah, she's minus 185. So you have Liam at 8,600. That's, you know, two and a half to one to win, or is it more? Pretty much. And in addition to that, you have a, an inside the distance line of plus 125, on a slate without that, you know, without a lot of great inside the distance lines. I mean, you have, you have some great, you know, some grappling upside fights, but, but you don't have that many, if any, like real strong inside the distance lines. So when you have this, this combination, the plus 125 inside the distance, plus the 8,600 price, plus the minus 260. I mean, this is clearly the best value, I, I, I believe, you know, on the slate here. However, that doesn't necessarily mean that Raposo is not okay. I mean, we got you always have to take a look at that. You know, whenever you have one fighter who is, I don't know, looks like such an obvious play from the metrics, try to see if the opponent looks at least even decent. The, the, the issue with Raposo is that his inside the distance line is really non-existent here. I mean, it's plus 750. So is that going to deter me from playing him? You know, because you really want to play the fighter who's against the highest owned fighter on the slate, which I imagine Lima is, is either going to be or he's threatening to be, or at least some combination of him with Makachev or something like that. So you'd like to play the fighter that is against him. The question you have to ask is getting a win going to be good enough, you know, because you're already fighting a losing battle as far as money line goes. I mean, he's 7,600 and he only wins the fight. 
one every, you know, three, two and a half, three times or whatever. So uh, it's rough. Normally, I would say that you should probably play him anyway, just because of the leverage that you get. So I am going to stick with that. I don't really have too much uh, fight detail on Raposo. I've heard some people say that he's a striker. I've also heard some people say that he can wrestle. And I, and I did see uh, Lima's last opponent, uh, last opponent get the better of him as far as takedowns go. So maybe, I don't know, on short notice, maybe that's going to be Raposo's path. But we'll see. But I definitely think that given how good of a play Lima is going to look like, that you should you certainly have to play some Raposa, especially in, in 150 minutes. All right, Aline Perez versus Jocelyn Edwards. Now, again, as I mentioned earlier, the theme of this card is not, you know, ceiling based on inside the distance uh, props. The, the, the theme of this card is ceiling based on style. And you have several fights here where one fighter, if he or she wins, is going to rate to score a lot of fantasy points because they're a grappler and wrestler. And this is one of, you know, Aline Perez's main path to victory here is going to be getting a bunch of takedowns against, uh, against Jocelyn Edwards. And you have that, that, that magic combination of Aline Perez both going for takedowns and Jocelyn Edwards basically being unable to stop them. So whenever you have that, I mean, you have to respect it. So, so Aline Perez, regardless of what her inside the distance line is, is going to be a very strong play, especially on a shorter slate. So her inside the distance line is pretty poor, plus 340, but it, even in decisions, she can get over 100. So um, I think she's certainly one of the better plays just because, of again, of all that grappling upside. Um, Jocelyn Edwards, on the other hand, I mean, she, again, her money line is reasonable enough, but where is her upside coming from? You get Edwards inside the distance, not Edwards. Uh, Edwards inside the distance plus like 500. That's like pretty brutal, you know? I mean, all I will say, though, is that, is that if, in fact, Perez goes for all these takedowns, you never know. I mean, Jocelyn Edwards could kind of luck into a submission somehow, but I don't know. Uh, and I don't think that Edwards, that Perez is going to be overwhelmingly popular to justify pay, pay, uh, playing Edwards just for leverage. So I think it's really a favorite or pass as far as, as DFS goes here. Um, all right, so Basil Hafez versus Nikki Gall, and this is another one where the the the, the favorite is the A side here. Um, the the inside the distance line is not particularly high. Um, what is it? I mean, actually, at plus one hundred five, which is better than I thought it was going to be, plus the fact that he's kind of probably probably we've seen him once, right? Go for a whole bunch of takedowns. So he's got just an incredible ceiling here. So you, you have to prioritize him, you know, as one of the top plays on the slate. Mickey Gall, 7K. I mean, again, just because maybe Hafez is going to get ownership, get a little bit of leverage here. But what does the Gall win look like? I mean, Gall by TKO is plus 1,800. I mean, Gall inside the distance plus 560. I mean, is, is just getting the win enough. You'd have to think that you could do a little bit better than someone is just going to, I don't know, how is he going to win this fight? Getting, <laughs> just having, st stuffing the takedowns and winning a striking battle, I guess. Or maybe he lucks into some kind of submission as well. You know, that's the one thing, you know, when, when you have these guys that are not that great, like Hafez, who's going to be constantly shooting, you know, the opponent, if they have any kind of jujitsu or submission skills at all, you never know what, what can end up with in these scrambles. So I guess, I guess Gall in 150 max is going to have to be played. And maybe Gall by submission, we get to the betting breakdown. I think that'd be somewhat interesting. But as far as DFS goes, it's again, Hoff has very strong favorite here. Uh, Nico Price versus Alex Morono. Um, 8,900, 7,300. Now, Morono doesn't really have that same type of grappling upside, so we're going to have to rely completely on his inside the distance line. And it's actually pretty good, you know, plus 115. Uh, 8,900, that's pretty much what you want. 
It's certainly not as good as Hafez, who's inside the distance line is similar, but also comes with a great deal of wrestling upside. So I would definitely put Morono below Hafez, but there's certainly nothing wrong with this, right? As a, as a pretty reasonable favorite here. So we're going to put Morono in here just for now. Uh, and Nico Price on the other side, I mean, he's got to have something, right? Isn't his inside the distance line reasonable? Let's take a look. It's a rough card. Let's see. Nico Price, is it even plus 400? Yeah, okay. Price inside plus 300. All right, that's that's that, that's something. All right. At his price, I would consider that a very reasonable punt. Okay, so this is actually the first of the of the reasonable punts. Like there's him, there's Raposo. I guess Raposo's okay, but Raposo more for leverage. I, I actually do think that price so far has got to be considered the best underdog, right? I mean, we haven't found any of them that have a plus 300 inside the distance line. So let's put him in for now. Jake Matthews versus Phil Rowe. Um, this rates to be probably a yawner, but we have to respect it because of the, of the pricing here. 8,300, 7,900. You don't need to get that much to get there. So let's take a look. I mean, I don't know. Matthew's inside plus 240 as the underdog. Better inside the distance line than Rowe. And Matthews has some takedown upside. I don't, yeah, okay, I'm down. Yeah, let's, uh, oh, he's not the, I thought he was the underdog. That's the, so I guess it is kind of fair. Um, crap. I, why did I think Phil Rowe was the underdog? Because I think everybody's, why do you think Phil Rowe is the favorites? I think everybody's picking him. So I do think, unfortunately, that that Matthews is the better side here. His inside the distance line is a little better, and he's got the takedown upside. So this is a card that's very bereft of underdogs. Um, but we'll see. Grant Dawson versus Joe Selecki. All right, I'm just going to come right out and say this. This, 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 this fight and this line and this price discrepancies just feels it sticks, okay? And, and again, that's this is not my skill set of like figuring out where the line should be or whatever, but I don't know, man. You have Dawson who got scorched in his last fight and – yeah, he, he won a couple before that, including just like just laying on uh, to, to Kugoff, I forget his name, who had nothing to offer as far as his grappling. He was almost just knocked out by Ricky Glenn a couple of fights before that. And then you have Joe Selecki, who's been doing doing really, really well. And in his last fight, he was... He was, he got a takedown, but then he got reversed. He was going for an arm bar and he got caught in some weird like slam situation and he just landed on his head. I mean, what, what are you going to do? Um, for those of you that are laying this this money on, on Grant Dawson, I, I, I don't know, man. Uh, and, and as a result, I'm probably going to be somewhat biased in this, but let's just take a look. So Dawson, we don't worry too much about his inside the distance line, but still it's pretty strong. I mean, it's plus 160, which in and of itself is not good for his price, which is 9,300. But he is going to go for a bunch of takedowns. And, and if he wins, he's probably going to get a lot of control time as well. And the thing I worry about, if you fade him, is that Selecki, he is really good a submission guy and really good at jujitsu. So I have so it's possible he might not fight the takedowns as much and try to be able to do something off his back, which I mean, that's a rough way to win. And it, it contributes to Dawson's upside when he does win because it just adds minutes to the control time. So I'm not going to completely fade Dawson, to say the least, but I am going to take a shot at some selecty on the other side. I mean, he's – he's I, his inside of this line probably doesn't exist, but he is, he is a submission guy. And whenever you have a fight that's, like, on the ground – and one of the guys is decent at submissions. He's always live as far as I'm concerned. 
So I'm going to probably take a shot at him at 6,900 here, probably more than I'm supposed to. All right, Roman Kapula versus Cesar Almeida. So this is a, a pure striker versus striking matchup, but I want to separate these guys a little bit, okay? I think they both have the same inside the distance line. Was it plus 250? Let's take a look. <laughs> now, well, plus 200. So that's actually pretty good, okay? A couple of problems is that how much of that is really in the first round versus the second and third? I really don't think it matters that much on a 12 fight card. You know, like if you get a, a second round KO from one of these guys and get 90 points, 95, I think it's going to be good enough at 8K in a 12 fight card. So I do think that you have to you have to prioritize this fight a little bit. These round one props are pretty annoying. You know, Copula plus 400, Almeida plus 600. You know, it's it's tough. But to separate these guys a little bit, Cesar Almeida is definitely a pure kickboxer with no takedown upside. Where Roman Copula is, 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 yes, he's a kickboxer, but he does have the possibility for takedown upside. Now, he hasn't shown it, in the last several fights. But he does have the skill set. And if, in fact, he does opt for that, he's going to have a big edge there. So, yes, it's a parlay of him wanting to go for takedowns and then getting them. But I think that that does give him more upside than Almeida. I think otherwise they're very they're very much the same with the same inside the distance line, the same skill set. But if you give Popilov an extra takedown, and control time or two takedowns, two pits of control time uh, added to his ceiling, I think it makes him a little bit better play, a better play. So I do prefer the Kapilov side over Almeida in DFS. All right, Randy Brown versus Aleski Dos Santos. Um, let's take a look at this. Let's look at these odds here. I mean, the price, 8,500, 7,700. I don't imagine this is a great inside the distance line. Yeah, Brown plus 200 and 8,500. I mean, you compare that to Lima, for example. Now, Brown's going to be higher, uh, lower owned for sure, but I mean, I'd rather just get down to Kopulov and, and Almeida at the same inside the distance line, you know, than pay up for, for Brown here. Dos Santos plus 300, just a little bit too expensive for this. Neither one of them has a lot of takedown upside, if at all. So I think this fight's probably a fade. All right, now we get to some, like, the, kind of the meat and potatoes, so to speak. So Almeida would be the meat, and I guess Corona would be the potatoes. Um, so this is this is, this is is a nasty fight for DFS, because <laughs> this could go, like, four ways. Almeida could completely own Romanoff and get like a billion takedowns and route to either a first round finish where he scores 130 or a second round finish where he scores 130 or a three round decision where he scores 120, you know, with a whole bunch of takedowns and control time. That is certainly one way this fight could go. Another way this fight could go is Romanoff could just basically show up the way he's supposed to, or the way he has been, be that much bigger than Almeida, take him down, and score 125 in a round one sub, or round one grounded pin. That's certainly in the offing. The, the other way this fight could go is the way Romanov's last fight went, where it just becomes a striking match. And, and Romanov's just good enough to stop the takedowns of Almeida, and Romanov saw that the last fight that he won was just keeping it at range and striking. And this fight just goes three rounds and completely busts. Right? So a lot of ways this could go, but the one way that it could go that could win you 200,000 is the Romanov showing up like an animal and, and kill him. And that's certainly within the range of outcome. So if, if I had to play this fight, I would probably, considering what, what we've seen in the underdog so far, I think I would take my shot and just, just hope that Romanoff was good enough.
um, and, and realize that it would be GPP only, that I don't think he has much of a floor. But I think it's almost, I don't want to say binary in the wrong way. I, I just really think that he's either going to be good or he's not. You know, I think that he's either going to win or he's going to look really, really bad. But the thing is that usually when that happens, I say, OK, so let's just just play both sides. I just think there's also variations where he looks bad. And doesn't and Almeida doesn't really smash because Almeida doesn't really finish people too often. Couldn't finish Derek Lewis in five rounds of, of, of 40 minutes of control time, pretty much. So this fight's a little confusing. I, I'm certainly not going to 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 kill you for playing either of these or for fading the whole thing. But this fight does have just an incredible amount of upside. And I think if I, you know, cut to my head, whatever, I would I would try to make sure to get it at least 30% of both of these guys and uh, but not lock the whole fight in because there are plenty of bus paths for this fight. All right. Uh, Kellen Holland versus Michael Olazechuk. Um, basically striker versus striker, but both these guys are well-rounded enough. I mean, they, they could, they could grapple if they need to. Um, they would both probably prefer to strike. And let's take a look like Holland you know, pretty strong inside the distance line here. It's what's it plus one minus one twenty five and minus one twenty five at this price at nine k is very very strong. So he's probably going to show up as a decent play. Doesn't really have takedown upside though. Like if he's going to win, it's probably going to be by by just outstriking him. I mean, he might get a submission, but it's not going to come from really takedowns. So I think he's fair. I think he's fine. Once again, the interesting piece is the other side of this. This is H up play. So he, inside the distance, is, I mean, he's plus 320. I mean, it's it's, it's, it's the same as, as Price. Um, so I think that both of those guys, Price, Olazaychuk, I think these guys are pretty reasonable punts here. You want to know the truth. Um, and again, as far as Holland goes, yeah, I mean, I, what am I going to say? He's got a perfectly good inside the distance line, not a smash inside the distance line. He doesn't have a takedown upside, but I think he's just as good of a play as say Perez, not Perez. Uh, I was going to say Morono. He's got a better inside the distance line, but then Morono, he's a little bit more expensive. They're very similar as far as I'm concerned. And their, and their opponents are very similar. So, um, yeah, I think they're both part. All four of those guys are part of your of your player. All right, so now you get to these five round fights, and the unfortunate reality is that you know five round fights are tough to fade. Uh, not to say you can't, but being able to have access to those extra two rounds if the if you don't finish is a really big deal, and and unfortunately, this. First of the five round fights is one where you're going to probably get the benefit of those five minutes, those five rounds uh, to a very strong, uh, uh, by a very strong factor because Strickland, if he wins, he might not be able to get Costa out of there early. I mean, he could, but he can carry his cardio for the full five rounds. And he can rack up a lot of fantasy points. Like even, even if they're not takedowns, which they won't be, like a lot of significant strikes in those last four, in those last two rounds that can get there where um, uh, other fighters are going to be more reliant on their finishes. So it's going to be, uh, he's going to look, he's going to be a pretty strong play. I don't think he's got the ceiling as, say, Almeida, right? I don't think he's got the ceiling of someone say even, I don't know, even I guess he's got the same ceiling as Holland. Uh, I mean, definitely doesn't have the ceiling of Makachev, but he's going to look fine. He's just going to look, he's going to look like a better play than Morocco. He just is, just because even though the inside of the distance line isn't that great, the, the way he does, he, he performs in the five, in those five rounds and he's going to rack up probably a hundred points at least. 
Um, Costa, on the other hand, he is not one that's going to really benefit from the five rounds too much. I think if it goes to the five rounds, I think he's might be a little bit screwed. So he's going to be really reliant on his inside the distance line. So it better be like, like a plus plus 300 at least let's at worst. Yeah. I mean, there you go. I mean, plus three twenty five. So unfortunately he's another guy who's a pretty reasonable punt here. And because Strickland is going to be popular because it's a five round fight, it's going to hit the optimizers. It makes Costa even a little better. So uh, let's take a goal out of here with Costa. And then in the main event, you have Makachev versus Poirier. And, and, and here, I mean, you don't, you don't really need the five rounds. This is the, I mean, listen, certainly couldn't hurt your fantasy output, but if, if, if Makachev wins here, it's, I just, I think if either, I don't know how this fight makes it to pass the third round, for example, what is this fight to go to, to finish? I mean, it's gotta be ridiculous, right? Fight ends inside. It's like plus, well, it's plus 550. I mean, you know what this means? I mean, 20% of the time it does go to the distance. But so I guess you do need those five rounds for those 20%, I guess. But look, Makachev has takedown upside. He's got a ridiculous inside the distance line. Let's take a look at it. I mean, inside the distance is he's minus 310. Pretty ridiculous, right? Um, round one, he's plus 200. That's that's actually not that great. Okay. Um if this were a 14 fight card, I would say, ooh, you try to get your ceiling elsewhere, maybe because he's gonna be so highly owned, but I don't know, man. It's it's uh those metrics are pretty tough to fade. Maybe you're just supposed to eat it and then just hope some of these punts come in. Um on the other side, I mean you just can't play um DFS without playing some Poria, you know, just because the way it works is Makachev's metrics are going to look so strong and it's going to be so popular that you're just going to have to try it, you know, and, and hope that you get lucky and hope he gets a KO or, or, <laughs> or hope that he survives and draws Makachev out five rounds. I mean, if, if Poirier loses and he, he makes it five rounds somehow, he, depending on how the rest of the fight go, the rest of the card goes, he could get there in a loss at 6,800. So, um, that's again not the not the most likely outcome, but it's certainly part of the range of outcomes here. Well, what is Poirier inside the distance for the hell of it? I mean, plus five hundred. That's not that bad, right? And I'll say this: that I can't imagine it coming late. You know, so I think that uh, I think that you have to play some Poirier. So, I mean, in in summary, I guess. Let's just go over this again. I mean, Lima is the clear value play. You play some Raposa as leverage. Uh, Hafez, clear upside. I wouldn't play Gall. Matthews, if I had to pick one over Rowe, uh, I, I, I would pick Matthews. Uh, he's a little more grappling upside. Uh, Dawson, I think, could bust here. Um, even if he gets the win, because he can get takedown and control time, but not the finish. And, not a lot of ground and pound. Who knows? Maybe he only scores 100, 9,300, something like that. Um, Selecki, probably a decent punt, I suppose. Copy Love Almeida, this is a solid fight to target. You know, the, 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 the lower amount of entries that you enter, the more likely you are to play this, you know, because one of these, one of these guys is getting 90 at least. And that's, that's a lot you know, when you think about it. If you're, you're in 20 max. So I think I think this is I probably didn't emphasize this enough. I, I think this fight is is pretty it's just pretty good, you know. And I would prefer Coppola because of that small bit of grappling upside. Brown is just the Santos fade. Almeida Romanoff. You'll you'll get this wrong wrong one wrong, whichever, whatever you do, but but I think you do have to play a full 30% of either of these guys. Oh, Zaychuk, probably decent punt. Costa, probably decent punt. Poirier, probably just a decent punt. So, um, 
that's pretty much all I have for now. I'm going to do a betting breakdown as well tomorrow, where or actually close to maybe Friday, where we get contrarian and kind of like kind of make fun of who the public is picking. And then again, Friday night or Saturday morning, we'll do a line of construction video where we, I don't know, where we uh, try to win that 200K. Uh, that'll do it. Good luck, everybody.